We've heard from the many doctors we've had on this show that the army of COVID deniers on social media are an enormous source of frustration and cause an unneeded dent to morale. However, in an East Surrey hospital this month, COVID skeptics created a more practical challenge. Oh. If you want to have a quick conversation, I can just quickly debrief him and tell you what the current issue is and what the problem is here. Since being moved from AMU, none of the family have been to uh, consult with what's his medical condition. Yesterday he went off the radar. The, the hospital have been lying to all the family. What are you, what are you doing with him? He, My main concern is his safety. No, and at the moment, not. you are making him unsafe. No, right, he's not. taking his oxygen off. He's going to die if we don't put it back on. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Can I just say something? It is against the law. You put yourself all at risk, OK? We yeah. need to step outside. If you go home... We need to... We need to... If you go home, you will die. He has coronavirus pneumonia affecting both of his lungs. Yeah. He's on steroids called dexamethasone. He's on antibiotics to treat concurrent bacterial infections. OK? Right. That's and, the treatment he's on. And that's it? To my knowledge, if we get his drug chart, I can tell you what he's on. Right, OK. He's, he, I, I wrote him, so I emailed him to the hospital about saying that the family wasn't happy with the steroids and the antibiotics and they'd be able to replace it with vitamin C, vitamin D and zinc. Plus there was another one, I forget what the lawyer told me earlier. But, um, None of those well. are proven treatments for coronavirus. Huh? However, yeah. antibiotics and steroids are. The person they're trying to take the patient off oxygen against the wishes of his doctor was Toby Hayden Lee. Um, he describes himself as the patient's Mackenzie friend, which is an untrained legal observer. Patients have the right to them. It's quite a, you know, it's a fine system, obviously going quite wrong there. Um, you heard them there saying, you know, ignoring all of the wishes of the doctors, saying, no, he can come off oxygen, it's completely fine, then disputing all of the different functioning medicines he was being given and demanding that a bunch of basically vitamin supplements replace those effective treatments. At the moment, you might think, oh, what's going on? Is this just some people who've read some stuff about the correct treatment for coronavirus and want to have their, their voice heard in a particularly obnoxious and quite chaotic fashion? Um, no, the next part um, of the clip shows us the true motivations of the people involved. Thank you so you're putting this whole world up with bold no, 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 and you are. You are. What, you me are. personally? Yes. Why is that? Why am I, why am I personally? Really. Listen, can I just say something, please? I am his next of kin. Right. right. You know now, what? sorry, Doctor. Doctor, now, if he's going to leave, now, obviously, they've got oxygen indoors. He'll last about half an hour before he goes. What? Oxygen? I'm not giving him oxygen to get home with. No, what I'm no, saying is, what I'm saying to you is we've got oxygen at home. Not this much. Coronavirus or, you say corona, can you define coronavirus? SARS-CoV. SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, that hasn't been proven to exist. But it, was, it was declassified. It's high, highly no, it, was it was declassified on March 19th, 2020. It's no longer no, highly, highly no, contagious no, infectious no, disease. SARS-CoV-2 hasn't been proven to exist. Now, I mean, you've got to feel, I feel for everyone involved. I feel for everyone on that ward. I feel for that guy who's been taken off his oxygen. I mean, it seems that he was, you know, in on this as well, but he's been taken off his oxygen. The doctor's pretty confident that if he leaves that, he's going to die. He says he's got oxygen at home. Those don't normally last for more than five or, or six hours if you're, you know, requiring the kind of pressure that you have in a hospital. So this is not going to work out well for the guy if the, the visitor gets his way. But you also just have to, you know, the doctor there, you know, imagine you're going into work every day, you're seeing, you know, you're seeing so many people die. It's one of the most traumatic experiences of your life, probably the most traumatic experience of your life. We know how many doctors are getting PTSD and you've got someone who is coming in, trying to take one of your patients off oxygen and telling you that SARS-CoV-2 doesn't exist. How do you define it? Um, it, 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 was, it was shown that it's, it's taken off the, the dangerous infections list. This isn't even a thing. Um, we just want to get him home and, and feed him some vitamin D. Um, we'll talk about the, you know, the political surroundings that have allowed events like this to happen in one moment. First of all, let's take a look at what happens next. The security are called to have the pair removed from the hospital. Yeah, I'm I'm your treatment. Treatment. I, I need to understand what your plans are. You're going to be are. removed by the security guard now. Okay? So, get off, or, mate. Or, or, or what? Listen, or just what? get off him, please. Uh, that's, that's a legal paper. That's my son. Uh, I need that paper. This is legal paperwork. I'll walk out of here. Let me give the paperwork to her. Well, let go, let go. Listen, let go! I'm trying to listen. Listen, 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 I'
We've got sick people here. Exactly. Right. Yeah, two, yeah, two of them standing next to me. Yeah, you two are sick. Yeah, Excuse me, can we have a conversation? Yeah. Now we're outside it. Can you put a mask on, please? I'm exempt. Show me your exempt letter. I don't need to be exempt Can we take him outside the walls? No, you said bring it out here. Yeah. Yeah, I am not right. leaving my husband if he wants to come. With me, he's coming with me. Paul was contacting me. What do you mean, no? Hmm? Did you just say no? There's no, no, no visitors in the hospital. Sorry? There's no visitors in the hospital. Yes. We're not visitors, we're coming here to pick Paul up. You can't go home. Says who? Me and his doctor. Well, you, I mean, you've got no power of attorney over him. You can't decide what he can... What, if he wants to leave, he can leave. You can't stop him. You can't take him home when he's going to die. If he wants to leave, if he wants to go and die at home, that's up to him. If he wants to go and die at home, that's up to him. I mean, there are actually some circumstances where that probably is a reasonable argument when someone is in hospital. And normally in that situation, the doctors are incredibly responsible. And they say, if that's what you want to do, if you are now in a palliative you know, state, um, if we know that your life is going to end soon and we just want to make this as comfortable for you as possible at home, that's something doctors are very used to doing. What doctors aren't used to doing is have someone storm in with no mask on, going through you know wards where there's patients at real, real risk, um, and and dragging someone away, Aaron. I mean, what do you make on that? I suppose both from the level of, you know, how chaotic that must be if you're working in that hospital, but also how did we end up here, where we're in the middle of a, you know, a pandemic? Yeah, obviously in this country, actually, there's there's much lower vaccine skepticism than we um, initially had feared, but you still do have this very noisy minority who are not only on social media saying, oh, it's all due to false positives, COVID-19 is just like the flu. And now you've got some examples of them storming into hospitals and dragging patients out. Yeah, I think it's really important to say, Michael, actually, from the, from the start, that in Britain, this is less of a problem than elsewhere. You know, you're looking at places like France, where basically 50% of the population aren't really sure they want to take a vaccine. I think, and also what's interesting, in the last few weeks is actually things are moving in the right direction for Britain. So, Already within Europe, we were one of the, the least COVID sceptic nations and it, it's getting better. For all the criticisms you might want to make at the BBC, I think principally that's because we have a public service broadcaster with this huge market share, huge, 80% of radio, TV, huge online footprint. And that squeezed out the COVID denying right wing press. That's one thing. Secondly, again, I'm just trying to sort of, I'm playing devil's advocate here. You know. It, it, it's highly probable this stuff happened in 1919 with the flu. It's, it's highly probable that a, a, a significant part of the population during a, a collective trauma, which is what this is, process it in such a way that they deny it is happening and they behave like this. You know, I, I'm sure there were similar sort of maniacal scenes during, during war, during famine, I'm sure. That's not to excuse it, but I think, you know, we, we have to sort of put it in with historic context. Thirdly, I think the government in its initial response to COVID uh, really provided fertile ground for these people, sadly. Fourthly, you've got social media. So I think social media comes actually quite, you know, quite low down in terms of people generating these conspiracy theories. What I find more worrying and actually this goes further back, is how the COVID denialism and, and th these people come out of movements like, you know, Freeman of the land, supremely anti-rationalist arguments, right? They, they won't be sort of swayed by empirical data. And that can, that can actually be traced back to, I think, quite mainstream positions. So for instance, uh, the MMRA jab, uh, you know, in, in, in the European Union, for instance, we don't have genetically modified crops because they're Frankenstein crops. There's no rational uh, argument for not having genetically modified crops it's because there was basically a scare surrounding them in the late 1990s generated by activists. And I, I think that we have to make the argument for science, for rationality. And I think actually in the last 20 years, that's not been a thing. And then finally, I think the reason why people are doing this and this was a, an argument I first heard in 2016, 2017, about why many, many people voted for Brexit precisely because they didn't think it would change anything. They didn't think leaving the European Union would actually have severe consequences, so they didn't really care. Because, quite frankly, since 1945, we've lived in a period of unprecedented political stability and, uh, and progress, rising living standards, rising home ownership, 
elimination of various diseases and hunger and we're all eating more kilo calories life expectancy is going up now i think since 2010 that's clearly plateaued but there have been no major wars no major famines no major pandemics and so i think to an extent this kind of this 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 denial as an actual sociological theory because like i say i think people always deny traumas when they're in the middle of it but this kind of movement of covid skepticism I think reflects that. These people have never seen a tragedy like this before. I find it hard to believe that if somebody had lived through Stalingrad or somebody had lived through Dunkirk or uh, 1919, the pandemic then, I struggle to believe they would exhibit the kind of political features that we're seeing with with, with the COVID scepticism. I think it's an outgrowth almost of unprecedented abundance and, and stability and not much happening. And again, it's, that's why they're processing this in a strange way. Now, that's not to excuse what they're doing. That man is an idiot. You know, I think he should be locked up. And I say that as somebody who thinks the prison population should be significantly reduced. Uh, but but I do think it's deep-seated. And I do think to an extent it's it, it's explicable. If you look at the long durée of politics, really since 1945, combine that with a, a move against rationalism, really, in the last 20 years. You then add on uh, poor communication from the government and then, of course, social media. And this makes sense. We do spend a lot of time sort of critiquing the BBC for not being not even sufficiently critical of the government, but for basically covering for the government by making everything seem like a natural disaster instead of potentially any fault of of Boris Johnson. But when it comes to keeping people living in the same universe, which is to some degree evidence based, um, they're quite good at that. So if you look at the United States, you have a much higher level of COVID skepticism than you have here. And that's because they don't have a public service broadcaster and half of the population are watching something owned by Rupert Murdoch, which is precisely actually why we should be quite worried about GB News coming in this country and trying to compete with the BBC. I mean, I don't think they will be able to sufficiently or severely compete with them, but you could imagine them getting sort of 10 to 20 percent of the population who are sort of addicted to watching that Andrew Neil show. And we know that Andrew Neil, chair of The Spectator, that has been the main outlet for COVID scepticism in this country. So you have to think if the same people who currently work at Talk Radio, Talk Radio, you know, not many people listen to it. It's very much a sort of minority endeavor. Um, they get a lot of attention because they say outrageous things on Twitter, but you know, a lot less people listen to, to Talk Radio than they do LBC or to the BBC radio channels. But if you have lots of the people who are on Talk Radio who are, you know, Julie Hartley Brewer apparently is being, um, you know, looked looked upon as someone who might go on GB News with a big show. She has been someone who's been pushing all year this false positive story, whereby it's just a it's just a pandemic which which looks like it's really bad because of the number of false positives, and really there was never a second spike. You know, now they've sort of they change their stories every now and again. Um, now it's that oh, actually, yeah, of course there was a big spike, but people would have died anyway. Ah, yes, of course there was a big spike, but the lockdowns caused more damage. They change their story as each of their last stories becomes um, shown to be completely false. Um, and you can see how these these attacks on public service broadcasting from billionaires, from Rupert Murdoch, from GB News could be really dangerous here. It's also worth saying it's not only, you know, proper COVID skepticism that is a massive minority in this in this country. It's also actually, you know, lockdown skepticism, which, you know, is a much more respectable seeming position, the, the kind of thing that Julia Hartley Brewer believes. I don't think she'd be dragging anyone out of a hospital, but she does think that lockdowns do more harm than good. That doesn't have any scientific backing. And actually the public on issues like that are more informed than Boris Johnson, it seems, because the, the public consistently have backed going into lockdowns and taking serious early action against COVID-19 when Boris Johnson has avoided having to make that decision. If we put the public in charge of the COVID response, we might not have had 100,000 people die.